Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements' in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 8 uh, and, and we're taking up the book of Nehemiah, and we're actually teaching on it verse by verse. I had a long conversation with a, a friend of mine this week uh, who's a, a minister uh, over in a, a, another state, and uh, I had the opportunity to teach at one of the morning services at the conference that I just attended, uh, and, and he came and he said, you know, I haven't had teaching like that, haven't heard teaching like that, and I haven't taught like that in a long time. Thank you for teaching this morning because, because we don't only need exhorting and we don't only need preaching, we need teaching. And, and you taught today, and it stirred me to get back to teaching again. Uh, and, and, and I'm always encouraged, uh, I'm always encouraged, Bishop, that I don't have to give a lot. I just have to give a little, and I'm biblical. Because, because in Isaiah, he said, how will, how will teaching take place? How is it that the Lord will speak to us through the scriptures? This is, this is the way it is. It's, it'll be line upon line, line upon line. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. And, and I told him, I said, I, 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 for, for years, for about five years, I, I, I didn't teach the way the Lord was leading me to teach. I taught the way I heard everyone else teach. I didn't, I didn't teach the way the Lord was directing me to teach. I just preached like I heard everyone else preach. Until finally, uh, the Lord got my attention through another minister that reminded me of that this week. Uh, and I heard him teach verse by verse by verse by verse. And I remember sitting down and weeping and saying, you can teach the Bible just like this. And the next week I started a series on 1 Corinthians. And I think it went for a year and a half or something like that. <laughs> every verse. And, and there's truth in every verse. And there's things we've never seen in the Bible and God's Word before. And there's things He can help our lives with in every word. I think right now, and they can put it up on the screen for us, to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 that says, All Scripture... That would be every verse in Ecclesiastes and every verse in Lamentations and every verse in Jude and every verse from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21. Every verse, all Scripture is given <clears throat> by inspiration of God. It doesn't mean God said it. God didn't say everything in the Bible. There's quotations from the devil in the Bible. But every Scripture that's recorded, God inspired that they would be recorded. And there's purpose, and, and there's value, and there's profitability, and there's blessing, and there's benefit in every single scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now hold that verse right there for a moment. Think about that. Every scripture may not be reproof, but some of them are. Every Scripture may not be a warning, but some of them are. Every Scripture may not be a promise, but some of them are. Every Scripture may not be historical, but some of them are. Every Scripture doesn't necessarily have to be for teaching or correction or reproof or instruction, but all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and will either teach or reprove or correct or instruct you in right living. For what purpose? The, the next verse, the last verse of the chapter, so that the man of God or woman of God or people of God, the servants of God, the worshipers of God, you all, me, us, so that we may be Perfect. That doesn't mean without fault. That's the word perfect that means mature and complete. That, 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 that's putting together the thousand piece puzzle and, and you've got three pieces left. And it's just not complete yet. And, and I can even do them when there's only three left. Come on. <laughs> and boop, boop, boop. There. Now it's perfect. That just means it's complete. That's just, and, and, and so that we can be committed. You'll never be complete without the Word of God. Amen. As important as every other spiritual exercise is. You can't just be, you can't just be a, a great giver, 
uh, a great worshiper, uh, a great witness, uh, uh, a great intercessor. Uh, th there's a part of Christian life that I'll never be complete in without the Word of God. So that you can be perfect, that's complete, complete, total, whole, thoroughly furnished, thoroughly furnished, and one translation that I use says thoroughly furnished and fully equipped, thoroughly furnished. Did you ever walk into someone's house, maybe you've had one, and you get it, and it's bigger than you used to have? And, and you have one piece of furniture. Now, Paul and I, we moved out, out, out into a, we, we moved out into a little farmhouse, and it wasn't because it was bigger than the one we'd been in before. It's because we were poor. And, and, and we had, a, we had a, a kitchen. He walked in through the front porch, an old farmhouse, you know, glassed in front porch. If you were smart, you took your boots off right out there because she'd come after you with a rolling pin if you walked in there without <laughs> taking them off. No, she wouldn't, but... <clears throat> And then you walk in, you were in the kitchen, and, and there was a table and a chairs. Uh, and then you turned left and you walked into the living room. And the living room was, oh, I don't know, two-thirds the size of this platform. And there was one red, now this is going to date you if you know what I'm talking about, beanbag, a beanbag chair, a beanbag. It's a bag of beans and it sits on the floor. And you walked into that room about three-fourths the size or two-thirds the size of this platform up here. That was our living room. And there was one red beanbag right there. I want you to know that was unfurnished. <laughs> or at least underfurnished. It was not fully furnished. It didn't have everything that it could have. It could have had a nice sofa. It could have had a couple of nice lazy boy rockers. It could have had a rocking chair. It could have had an end table on each side of that couch. It could have had a beautiful glass table right out in front of it. Could have had a big screen TV up on the wall, even though they didn't even make them then. Could have had some plants in there. That's like a whole lot of people's lives. They still have room to be furnished. Well, the Word of God, my verse disappeared, but it's still, it's still in the Bible, really. <laughs> Praise the Lord that the man of God, the woman of God, the, person, the people of God may be mature, complete, perfect, thoroughly furnished to every good work. I mean, prepared to do everything the Lord has for you to do. Thoroughly furnished. God's Word will do that for you. Thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So Nehemiah is just one place in the Bible. It may be one little line, line upon line, verse upon verse, precept upon precept, truth upon truth, promise upon promise, commandment upon commandment, until, until we're thoroughly furnished to every, every good work. Now, I'm just inspired to share with you this morning that, uh, that uh, uh, early on in, in, in pastoring, I've pastored for 35 years now. I'm in my 36th year. Of pastoring, that's not very long. Uh, I've got a lot more in me, <laughs> uh, and 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 we had a, a a dear one who who had fallen in love with Jesus. If you haven't, you should. You don't have to just know about what he looks like on a little card or picture. You can actually accept him as your savior and have a relationship with him personally. Uh, and she had, uh, and she said, "Well, the Bible is good, but I've got some extra books." Well, if they're books about the Bible and they enlighten you about some things in the Bible, I've got lots and lots and lots of books and lots of commentaries and study helps. I was over between services helping one of our young members. He wanted a good study Bible, and I showed him several of mine and a couple other uh, study helps as well. But, but she, had, she had some other books of revelation that, uh, that somebody said an angel came and said, well, this is in addition to the Bible. This is in addition to the scriptures, and you have to believe and accept and receive these books uh, uh, as well as the Bible. So I took her to the verses, uh, uh, both in Old Testament and New. There's three of them that talk about don't add anything to and don't take anything away from the scriptures. That means we're commissioned to preach it. We can't take out things we don't like and people don't like to hear, and we can't add to it. Uh, and that wasn't enough, and so I remember I took her to this verse right here, 2 Timothy 3, verse, verse uh, 17, 18. Uh, and, and I said, if the Bible is enough to thoroughly furnish and fully equip me, what else do I need? Yeah. 
if the Bible's enough to perfect me and complete me and thoroughly furnish and fully equip me, why do I have to have these two golden tablets that an angel gave some guy out from under a bush? Uh uh. No, no, we have the scriptures. Thank God for the Bible. All right, are you in Nehemiah? Nehemiah chapter 8. We've taken up, believe it or not, verse by verse. Verse by verse. I don't know how many weeks we've covered, but uh, but it doesn't matter. I mean, if it takes us two years, so be it. There's truth every time we open it. We looked at chapter 1 of Nehemiah, how, how, how the Lord laid it into his heart and on his heart to go back and to... Uh, to help those who were suffering uh, in his home region there uh, and hometown of Jerusalem, how the king uh, sent him and not only gave him permission, but also funded him, funded his trip in chapter 2. And, and, and chapter 3, and I love chapter, uh, chapter 3 uh, as well as chapter 2 uh, because it talks about all the people that served, all the people that contributed, all the people that were builders of the wall in chapter 3 and how everyone had a part. And no one just stood back and said, well, let them do it. They're good at construction. You know, let them do that music thing because they're good at music. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad sometimes because I think I'd spend more service time than would be appropriate. But I'm really glad I sit in the front row. Because then I just look forward and everybody I see is worshiping God. But sometimes when I've got things and people I'm praying with and things like that uh, between services and I come in, and then I see that everyone isn't worshiping God. And I wonder sometimes if we think that the people that stand up here and wear the robes and sit at the instruments, I think we think maybe sometimes that they're the praisers and they're the worshipers. When everyone in this whole building from that wall to that one and that wall to this one are the worshipers of God. There isn't one silent voice in heaven there's one choir that's a hundred million in heaven. We have it in Revelation chapter 5, and it says 10,000 times 10,000. That's a hundred million, and that's just one choir. And thousands of thousands. You know, little thousand voice choirs, there's thousands of them. And they're all singing. They're all worshiping. They all have their hands raised to heaven. They're all pouring out of their hearts. Lord, you're wonderful. Lord, you're awesome. Lord, you're great. Lord, you're righteous. Lord, you are worthy. Worthy is the Lord. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And there's nobody doing this. Wish they'd get over with this because I'd like to get to the Word. Well, the Word is good and the Word is necessary and the Word is profitable, but there are other things that we do like prayer. Come on, let's all pray right now and, and, and then it'll be, oh boy, when they get done with this, we'll get to the good stuff. Prayer is the good stuff. The presence of God is the good stuff. Let's take a minute to fellowship with one another, be a blessing to somebody, encourage someone, because the Bible tells us to do that, exhort one another daily, every day, and so when we do that, we're, we're being obedient to the Lord and, and what he told us to do. No, everything we do in God's house has value, has value. They, uh, they all served, they all participated, except for one group, and they were too high and mighty, and they didn't think they should have to participate, the nobles, and because they didn't have to participate, then one of the other groups had to double up on what they were doing. Remember that lesson? Yeah. Isn't that a good lesson? Yeah. And I said, that's why some of us have to wear more than one hat. Hmm? Number one, because you've been faithful with a little, now the Lord's entrusting you with more. Right. Or number two, because somebody else is lazy. Oh, I, I didn't mean to say that. I mean, busy. I meant to say busy. I, I just meant to say busy. Someone else is too busy. Too busy, and so you have to pick up the slack from the slacker. I, I'm, I, 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 you, know, you just have to pick up the slack. That's where that term came from. I thought I'd point that out. So, so you just have to wear more than one, more than one hat. I, I remember a minister, he was complaining to me. He was griping. There was no two ways about it. And I had to point that out to him on behalf of the Lord to get him out of that because he'll hurt himself. Complaining will hurt yourself. You hurt yourself every time. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, do everything without murmuring and without grumbling and without complaining. And he was complaining. He was complaining on all the things he had to do in ministry. And I said, well, let me point three things out to you. Number one, well, first of all, let me, let me tell you, repent, you old sinner. Repent for complaining. 
Thank God you have a strong enough back and strong enough arms and enough energy and enough resources, enough wherewithal to do it. Quit grumbling. Thank God for it. All right, now we're done with that. All right, number, number one, number one, uh, you, you've been faithful. That's the only reason the Lord ever gives you more is because you've proven yourself faithful with what you have. He who's faithful with that which is a little, they'll be faithful with much. Never, ever, ever despise, despise small beginnings. That's what Proverbs says. Despise not small beginnings. Whatever you have, the smallest little responsibility you have, the, the, the most insignificant, unseen, nobody notices things that you have to do for the Lord, you'll be faithful with that. And he said, if you'll be faithful with a little, you'll be faithful with a lot. If you'll be faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. That's what the Lord said. That's number one. He said, thanks for putting me under conviction. I said, I don't care what I put you under. Shut up and listen. I'm not done yet. I'm not done. You need some help. And so that's number one. Get happy about it. Get happy. Thank God for the opportunity. Number two, there's probably someone else that should be serving that isn't, and you get to wear their hat. You ought to rejoice in that because you'll get the rewards at the end and they won't. Now, you're not rejoicing that they won't, but God's just giving you more opportunity to accrue rewards at the end of all things. On that day, he'll reward everyone for what they've done, not for what they thought, not for what they were called to do, for what they've done for him. And then number three, you're probably at fault again because you should have trained some people around you to help. And maybe it's because you do too much because you like to do everything perfect and you know it's going to take longer to train people to do it right than it is just do it yourself. He was real quiet then. But nonetheless, nonetheless, a great Bible lesson. Thank you, Pastor. You helped me right there. You're welcome. That was in chapter 3. Chapter 4, Nehemiah and his prayers and the resistance to him. And the resistance, and he had, he, you might have resistance to being a Christian. It might be spiritual resistance, like, like, like demonic. It, it just may be personal resistance, like humans. It may be circumstantial resistance that just tries to keep, it may be things like your past. And there's always resistance and things keeping you, trying to hold you back and trying to hold you down and trying to restrict you. I think right now of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 says that, that because we're encompassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that easily besets us and run with perseverance, and patience, and tenacity the race that's set before us. Well, the first thing he said is lay these weights aside. Just lay those things aside. Just lay those aside. And, and there are always things that are intended to slow you down. Pray sometime and just say, Lord, what in my life is restricting my progress? What attitude in me is just restricting me from going higher and from going farther? Did you ever see them launch one of these hot air balloons? And they're all just full of sandbags and full of weights, and they just pitch those out until, oh, it starts to go. It starts to rise, and they pitch a few more out, and then they pitch the last ones out, and up she goes, and, and, and up it goes. They have to take the mooring line, and, and they have to untie it and let it go. There are always things holding you down from going higher, from progressing, and from rising. Whatever those things are, the Lord knows, and he'll help you. He said, lay them aside. If you're not aware of what they are, uh, he is, and he'll help you. Pray, be real intent on, on praying, be quiet as you pray, and he'll help you. The Lord will help you to know those things. Uh, chapter 5 and, and, and uh, uh, his, his example of unselfishness in chapter 6 and, and that, that, that great revelation about his relatives uh, down there at the bottom. And then chapter 7, uh, the wall was built and I'd set up the doors and the porters and singers and the, Nethan, or the Levites were appointed. And then that last verse, and we've covered that now, the priests, the Levites, porters and singers, and the Nethanim. The Nethanim were the ministry of helps in the Old Testament. As we've studied it now further, went to not, not, not the only people who, who, who I could find who could really give revelation into the, who the Nethanim were, were the Hebrew scholars and the Hebrew historians. And the Nethanim were the people who served in the Old Testament, first of all, tabernacle, and then the synagogues, and finally the temple. And they served from Joshua chapter 9, when they were first assigned, all the way up to 70 A.D. That's, that's 35 years after Jesus, when the Roman Empire came and completely obliterated the temple. 
and there was no place to serve. For 1,500 years, they served as volunteers. They wanted to serve. They said, just give me a place. They just weren't satisfied standing outside watching. They didn't treat church as somewhere to go to attend for two hours out of their busy life. They didn't try to fit God into their schedule, and they had work, and they had family, and they had their other pursuits, and they had their recreational hobbies, and they had all the other things that they did, and their travel, and whatnot, their education, and then they just kind of fit God into their busy life and felt good about it. They, they understood, no, there's more to this God. This is a living God. And, and see, there, there's, a, there, there's not just a plan for you. Uh, we watched a young gal. She got a, she got a, a, a new vehicle for her 16th birthday. And we watched it happen. Uh, and, and I'm not saying you should give your kids a new vehicle on their 16th birthday. I didn't. Uh, I questioned the wisdom of it. But uh, they gave her one. And they had Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, right across the hood. I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, plans to give you hope and expectation at your end. Uh, and, and, and it's not just the plans that the Lord has for you. You ought to ask yourself the question on occasion, what's God's purpose? For what purpose were you created? Is it just to take up oxygen? Breathe out a little carbon monoxide? Help the atmosphere? Do good for the environment? Hallelujah. That's the purpose for that I was created for. Take up space? There's a purpose that you were created. And when you discover, when you discover that purpose, to serve our God, represent our God, be a co-worker together with God. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. You are a worker together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and, and, and verse, verse uh, 9, I believe it is, 8 or 9. Uh, and it says you're a co-laborer together with God. Co-laborer and a worker together with God. And to help him and assist him and represent him in everything he does. No different than him walking along and saying, Matthew, come follow me. Peter and John, come follow me. James and, 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 and uh, come follow me. James and John, come follow me and, and assist him and help him to bring salvation to a fallen, lost, crying, dying, sighing world. There's a purpose for you existing. It's not to get everything that you want and amass it so you have the most toys at the end. There's a purpose for you existing. It's not get what you want and so you be happy and, and, and content. There's a purpose for you existing. And boy, when you discover it, nothing else will satisfy you. No other pursuit will satisfy you. No other possession will satisfy you. No other relationship will satisfy you. Amen. Here in chapter 8 then, we come to this verse. And if we get through verse 1, that'll be a little. I kind of doubt it, but we might get through verse 1 today. Uh, and, 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 and notice, if you would with me, somebody tell me. I'm, I'm not going to look. I'm, I'm going to close my eyes. Help me preach. What's the first word of Nehemiah 8 verse 1? Yeah. What? Yeah. You don't start off a sentence by saying, and. Imagine walk up to somebody at work tomorrow and say, and. No, the Bible's not written in chapters and verses. The Bible is, is, is written in an account or, or, or in a letter, as, as you'd write a letter. How many of you have ever written a letter to someone and said, chapter 3? Now, some of you have written <laughs> letters to me. You could have. <laughs> Pastor, I got a note for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even going to look over there. See? Uh, the Bible's not written, the Bible's written as it's a letter, or it's a set of instructions. Uh, and just like the set of instructions that you have, say, in your car or your vehicle, or if you buy a snowblower or a lawnmower or a sewing machine, it comes with a manual. And just to help you, I mean, I don't know how big the the, the Owner's manual is for my car. I mean, that thing, yeah, it's about that thick. And there was a light on in the dash this a week or so ago, and, and, and Paula said, well, I'll just look in the owner's manual. Well, I noticed, you know, it's like 287 pages. And so she started in page one, started reading, and then went to page two, and then went to page three, and then went to page four. And then went to page five. And then went to page six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And, and no, she didn't do that. They have categorized it in the front of the book to say exhaust system, 
and electrical system. And there's one sub chapter on dash lights. Well, she didn't go through the whole book. She just went right to that because they told her that was going to be on page 146. And she went to page 146, and there it was on halfway down page one. So oh, here's what it means. Uh, and, and boom, pressed a button, and off it went. The Bible was written in a divine flow that God himself inspired. And the translators, when translating it, didn't change a word, not even one. But they put chapter designations, and they put verse designations in your Bible so that we could better find our place. And I could tell you, look at Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 73, to see what it says. And you don't have to go through your whole Bible to try and find that one spot. You just open right up to that, and there it is. And, and so he's not done. He's not finished when he says, and, that's just a continuation. Sure, it's chapter 8, verse 1, but those were added for our re search purposes so that we could better study our Bible. So it says and. Of course you don't start a sentence and start a thought on and. That's just a continuation of verse 73. So the priests, Levites, porters and singers, some of the people and the Nethanim and all of Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities, and all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate, and they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read there before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and women and those that could understand in the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Moses the scribe stood up on a pulpit of wood which was made for that purpose. And beside him stood, and I'm not going to try to pronounce all those people's names and, and, and all those, those individuals who stood by him. Verse 5 and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, and lifted up their hands and bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Now, we're going to go on and we're going to read that. We're going to study that together. We're going to teach on it together. Verses 7 and 8 to 9 and 10. That great verse, verse 10 at the end, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And the, uh, verse 11 and, and, and verse 12. But the end of verse 12 is really the key to th that entire portion, those first 12 verses. The end of it, it says, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. That's why they all came together. They, they, they came together, and, and, and we know this. We know this. There were, if you go back one chapter and look at verse 66, how many people were there between the priests and the Levites and the Nethanim, the singers, the porters, and, and all of the people of Israel? How many people were there? Chapter 7, verse 66 says there were 42,360. That's how many people were there. Now, at the end of chapter 7, verse 73, the priests and Levites, porters and singers, some of the people and the Nethanim, they were dwelling in Jerusalem. They were the ones who stayed right there in Jerusalem. All of they who were serving in the temple, the priests, the Levites, and the Nethanim. Remember, the, the, the Levites were broken up into three categories. The Levites that would teach and encourage, the, the Levites that were singers, we know what singers are, don't need much of a definition there. Uh, and then, and then the, the Levites that were porters. What's a, what, what's a porter? They were basically the doorkeepers uh, and or the security. They were the security guards. Uh, we're told uh, in study that porters, uh, what they did is they, they constantly stood guard. Now, I'm thankful that there are angels constantly standing guard. But sometimes there need to be people. Angels with skin that constantly stand guard, and I'm thankful for them. Uh, and they would stand against 
idolers, uh, idolaters, and thieves. People who'd come in and they would steal things out of, the, out of God's house, not of God's temple. That's what the porters would do. They would be the doorkeepers. They'd open the doors, but they'd also keep the doors closed. Uh, and they did it not only at the temple, they did it actually out at the city gates as well uh, in Jerusalem. The singers, uh, as I shared, the singers were uh, uh, those who would sing psalms during their worship services. And the Levites, primary responsibilities to teach and as judges and as doing any menial task. The Nethanim were given to the Levites to serve. Their first tasks in God's house were to cut wood and haul water. Well, I wouldn't want to do something important if I was going to serve in church. Well, what's important? I said, what's important and what's not important? Everything is important in God's house and everything that was necessary. Do you realize, now maybe you've never just thought about this, and, and you'll be thankful that we're in the New Covenant, not the Old, the New Testament, not the Old. People brought animals into the house of God. We live in Wisconsin, and every now and then in Wisconsin, you go through territory, you know, a region, some of you live there, and, and there are some folks there of, of, this isn't a cut or a slam, it's just the way it is, they're Amish descent. They don't drive vehicles, they'll ride in vehicles, but they don't drive vehicles. They drive buggies. Buggies have no motors. Buggies have one horsepower. They're pulled by horses. You can always tell when you're in Amish country. You don't have to look at the farms and see the wires cut off at the pole. You don't have to see the long clothesline with all the clothes on there. Those are clues, but you didn't get very deep in Amish country before you knew you were there by what's on the road. Do I need to elaborate? Some of you are looking at me like, steamers. You know, stuff that horses leave when they, you, you get onto the parade, you go to the Oktoberfest parade, and all the floats, and, and then they'll come the Clydesdales, clunk, 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 big Clydesdale stuff, and there'll always be one guy walking behind him with a shovel yep. and a bucket. <laughs> Boy, didn't he get the glamorous job. Didn't he get the glorious job? Listen, if you want to serve in the house of God, you've got to be willing to carry a shovel and a bucket. Back in those days, they brought animals in. They brought sheep in and goats in and heifers in and oxen in as, as, as sacrificial offerings. That's what they brought in. Now, you don't bring those in, but you don't have somebody with a, with a pitchfork and, 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 a, and a big broom and, and straw and hay and stuff. Yeah, praise God. Sometimes messes need to be cleaned up in the house of God. Sometimes they do. There's not much glamorous about changing diapers in the church nursery. But every person in the sanctuary at that given moment is thankful for you. That you're doing it, not them. That you're doing it out there somewhere and not here. Everybody. You're helping and ministering to everybody. There's no glamorous. There's nothing glamorous about that. There's nothing glamorous about putting up a... a, a, a is that one gone? Okay. All right, go to this one. <laughs> There's nothing glamorous about putting... Putting a ladder up and crawling up and, and, and taking light bulbs out and putting light bulbs in. There's nothing glamorous about, about running a vacuum cleaner. There's nothing glamorous about cleaning the toilets or unplugging the toilets. But there are people who are just willing to serve in God's house, and it doesn't matter what you give them to do. They'll do it with all their heart. They'll do it with all their might. They'll be happy about it because they understand from their Bible, Colossians chapter 3, that whatever you do, you do it with all of your heart heartily, and you do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. As unto the Lord and not unto men. And when you serve in that nursery, you're doing that as unto the Lord. And when you clean that room across the hallway over there, you're cleaning that because you think the next person in there might be the Lord Jesus Christ walking in there. And you're doing everything you do for him and for his glory, and you're not doing it for you and for recognition. 
and, and, and as a producer of income, uh, and, and so that people can see you and watch you and, and, and comment on, on how well you do it. You do it for the Lord, and you hope nobody ever sees it. You do it for the Lord because he said whatever you do in secret, he'll reward you openly. Whatever you do for him. The priests, the Levites, singers and porters in the Nethinim dwelt in Jerusalem with some of the people, but the rest of the people, they dwelt all throughout the land. But on one day, everybody say one day. There's always been a set-aside day. There's always been the day set aside for worship. There's always been that day set aside. See, in, the, in, in, in Eden, it was that seventh day, and God created everything. Six days, the seventh day, that set aside for God. The Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. From that moment on, it became known as the Lord's Day. That's the day set aside. That's the first day of the week. That's called Sunday. And we worship our God, and we set everything else aside. Nothing else happens on the first day of the week, on the first part of the first day of the week, all by design. All by design. So that, so that we can go. Yeah, we have midweek services. We used to have Thursday night midweek services, and we changed to Wednesday night midweek services. If we have special guest ministry here, it might be on a Tuesday night or a Friday night. Friday night church? Friday night! Man, we had Friday night church last week at that conference that we were at. I, I, I greeted everybody, said, think about all the trouble you're not in because you're in church. <laughs> you could be in, but you're not because you're here, and you won't get, on, get in on it. No, we have Sunday night services. We have Monday night services. There's, there's nothing wrong with having a, having a service. The Bible says in the book of Acts, they had church every day. And as long as I'm on that, as long as you were interested... It says, it says right here that uh, this was on the first day uh, of the seventh month, and they were all attentive uh, as, he, uh, as he spoke the word. Now, 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 it says in verse 3 that he spoke from morning until midday. You know what that means? That means the preacher's message lasted six hours. See, some of you don't know whether to frown, smile, <laughs> nod. <laughs> you wonder what's coming next. Huh? Six hours. From morning, that's the rising of the sun, till midday, noon. Now, I don't care how late it gets in the year. The sun is up usually by 6 or 7 o'clock. And midday is always noon. And, and he just kept reading. Remember, he brought the Pentateuch to read to them. That's Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he read it all. Oh, yeah, he read the story of Joseph and his brothers. He read about Abraham, father of our faith. He read, he read about Isaac. He read about, uh, about Elizabeth and Jacob. And he read about Rebecca and Rachel. And, and, and he read about Moses and the burning bush. And he read about the Ten Commandments coming down. He, that, that, that's the only Bible that he had. Yeah. And, and, and it's not all commandments. People read that and they think the law of Moses. Well, that was the thou shalt, thou shalt not, and thou shalt, thou shalt. No, those five books were the books of Moses. They read Deuteronomy and all the promises that these days will be as heaven on earth for you. And all of these blessings will come upon you and overtake you. And I set before you this day. Life and death. Choose life that you and your seed may live. He read the book of Numbers, and, and he read about Dathan and Abiram and the earth opening up. And, 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 and he read about Miriam. And he read about the quail blowing in. And he read about God helping Moses by taking some of the anointing off him and putting it on the 70 elders. He read about Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, coming in and advising him on how to care for so many people. In God's flock. He, 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 he read all of that. It's not just commandments. It's promises. It's revelation of God's goodness and character and nature of his, of his love for humanity and, and his mercy. They read about the Passover. They read about the blood of the Lamb. And for six hours he, he, he read. And then it goes on and it says in verse 8, they read in the book of the law distinctly. That means word for word. And gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. That just means they explained it. 
They didn't add to it. They didn't change it. They, they, they just gave some explanation, caused the people to understand in verse 7, it says. And all the people stood in their place. How would you like to go to church and not have one of those big, cushy, thick chairs to, 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 to sit your blessed assurance on like you are right now? How would you like that? I don't have one of those chairs. They're, they're comfortable, aren't they? I still remember when we had steel folding chairs. Steel. Yeah, the metal ones. The metal ones. And one person came up. I mean, it was little bitty, 10 people. And one person came up and said, I think we ought to get pads for these chairs. I said, thank you. He said, what? I said, thank you. Go get them. Tell me we need something. Go buy some. So bless the Lord, he came and, 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 and actually we went and got them. He gave us some money. We went and bought them. And then they weren't thick enough. I said, well, give us some more money. We'll double them. And we did. We put double these little, little pads on every chair. Yeah, they didn't have chairs. They didn't even have pews. They had 42,000 people come to church service. 42,360 people. And it says they all came. They came out of the cities. They came out of the towns. They came out of the country. They got in the place right in front of the water gate. Now, that's not anything to do with Richard Nixon. <laughs> You know, water. That's, I don't know why they called it that. That's what they named the whole scandal. One, that was one of the gates. Remember all the gates when they built in the wall? We started, Remember all the gates? And one was the water gate. That's where the water flowed in for the city. That's what the Romans cut off in 70 A.D. to starve them all out. Hmm? Remember? Remember they had the, I don't remember what they called it. What did they call it? I mean, where all the stuff flowed out. The water flowed in. You know, the other stuff flowed out. What was it? The dung gate. Yeah, the dung gate. <laughs> Some of those people got to work on the dung gate, and they got their name in the Bible because they got to work on the gate. They had to, had to gate everything when the enemies were always trying to infiltrate and come in and hurt you. And so, so there were all the different gates in, into Jerusalem, and so they just got in front of the water gate, and they made a big pulpit. We'd call it a platform, a speaking position, and they elevated it up because 42,000 people, I mean, put them, put them all on just a flat. I mean, there are stadiums that are bigger than that. There are stadiums that hold 100,000 people, 80,000 people, 70,000 people. But he's just on a flat. And they built up that structure. I'm, I'm, I, can, I imagine that thing was a couple stories high. And he got right up on the top of that, 42,000 people out in front of him. And he opened the book of God. And he started reading. And he was still reading at noon. And they were listening. They were listening attentively. Nobody was falling asleep. And they were all standing the whole time. And they were lifting up their hands. They were saying, amen, amen. And they were weeping. And they were rejoicing. And they were laughing. And they were being encouraged. And they were giving, making the, the sense and causing them to understand what it was that, that, that the Lord was communicating them. This is church. Yes. This is church. Not stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, do a couple of things, uh, and then go home and think I hung the moon, think I did something really great for the Lord, satisfy, satisfy that little conviction on the inside of me. No, they came to hear from our God. They came to receive marching orders. They came to receive their, their instruction. They came to hear about him. And they hadn't, think about this, they'd been in captivity for decades, decades, 30 years. They'd never gone to a church service, not one time in 30 years. Some of them never. And they came back and they rebuilt the walls so that they could worship the almighty God again. And they got into that place and first thing he did was just open the book. Open the book. And all the people, not half the people, isn't it sad we've got such a small percentage of people in the United States of America that attend church anywhere. I commend every single one of you for being here. Came here, got up, drove here, traveled here, brought your families here, came by yourself. You continually come and you're faithful. If you're watching this broadcast and you go to another church, or if this is your church and you don't have another church and you can't travel and you can't get out, then you keep worshiping with us. We love you and God loves you and we'll keep being here and we'll keep bringing the word of God to you. But these people didn't, most of them come. Most of Americans don't go to church. Most of Americans don't attend church. Most of Americans don't go to a, to a mass. They don't go to an assembly. They don't go to a service on Saturday. They don't go to a midweek service. They don't go to a Sunday morning service, let alone even think about a Sunday night service. 
They stay home. They go sailing. They golf. They sleep in. They're hung over. They're too busy. They got places to go, things to do, people to see. 42,360 people lived in that place, in that city, and around that city, in their towns, and all of them came to that service. All of them. A L L. All of the people gathered themselves. They weren't called to worship. Any of you ever go to church with the bell? Oh, man, I think every kid that went to church and they had a bell, you know, on the rope, I think every one of us wanted to ride that rope. Because, man, you'd see one of those guys, and they'd pull that, you know, ding, and up it would go, and ding, up it would go, and ding, up it would go. And, man, every once in a while, he'd let one of us kids grab on that rope, and it would pull you right up off the ground, and back down it would come. And pull. That was a call to worship. That was a call to worship. The ringing of that bell was always a call. Come to the house of God. Come to the house of God. Come and worship our God. Come and assemble together. Come and sing his praises. Come and rejoice in his goodness. Come to the house of worship of our God. That was a call of worship. And today, I mean, we've got tweets, and we've got a website, and we've got posters, and we've got TV ads, and we've got newspaper ads, and we've got word of mouth, and we've got every way we can possibly think of, short of giving $100 bills away at the door, to get people to come to God's house. And they didn't have any of that. They knew the first day of the month had come, and it was time to get into the, get into the place of worship. They knew it was come to time, and, and, and they, didn't, they, they never had church before, some of them. Some of them hadn't had church for over 30 years, and, and, and they, they got that wall finished, and they said, it's time to go hear the Word of God. It's time to go worship. It's time to go and, and be taught. And all the people, I love it, all the people gathered themselves. No one else gathered them. No one else. Well, let's send the sheepdogs out and get all the flock. No, they didn't send anybody out. All the people gathered themselves. How refreshing it is when you don't have to call everybody three times during the week just to remind them that service starts at 8.15 on Sunday or 10.30 on Sunday. Uh, they gathered themselves. I mean, they got themselves out of bed. They set their own alarm, believe it or not. Huh? They got their kids, and they got their families. Well, I don't want to go to church. Well, who asked you what you wanted? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You're going to go. Yeah, you're going to go. I mean, your body probably talks to you sometimes and says, I don't want to go to church. Well, you don't have a voice in the matter. You're going. You're going with me. Come on. Your body's going along where you tell it to. Well, if they just had donuts at church. Come on, we got coffee. I'm thinking about doing away with that. Oh, <laughs> I was just kidding, but man, I felt rebellion and revolt. <laughs> all right, come on, let's finish up. And all the people gathered themselves. At some point, you have to take personal responsibility yourself. Now, normally I'm talking to young people here. Normally I'm talking to teenagers. Normally I'm talking to young couples. Normally I'm talking to 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 to. to people that are no longer out in Sunday school and, and, and are sitting in service like this. But I think in our day, I think, I think, I think, I think this message is for everybody. For, 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 for your daughter, this, this 12 or 13. Huh? Don't tell me 16. No, 13, huh? No. And, and me that's, 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 that's right on the doorstep of 60. Uh, and, and, and my dad that's right on the doorstep of 85, I don't think there's any place or any room to leave anyone out to say that it's your responsibility to seek God with all your heart. It's your, he, said, he said, if you'll seek me with all of your heart, I'll allow myself to be found of you. See, nobody else can do that for you. You have to determine and decide to do that for yourself. I love Psalm 91. I love the whole chapter. I love the last verse that says, with long life, he'll satisfy you and show you his salvation. But the first verse says, the very first verse of Psalm 91, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Now watch this verse when they get it up here, Psalm 91.1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the protective shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91.1, I please am asking you to notice what the first 
word is not. If, it, if there was a T in front of that and a Y after it, it would say they that dwell in the secret place. But this is not something you do with other people. This is something you do all by yourself, not with your kids, not with your wife, not with your husband, not with anybody else. You do this by yourself. One of my favorite stories in the whole Bible, Isaiah 38, was Hezekiah. And Hezekiah was told, set your house in order, for you shall surely die. Had a lethal, life-ending condition in his body. And here's what the Bible says he did. Listen, here's what the Bible says he did. He turned his face to the wall. And he said, oh God of eternity, God of heaven and God of my fathers. And he talked to God. There's a time you've got to turn your back on everyone else and everything else. There's a time for agreement in prayer. There's a time to call for the elders of the church. There's a time to worship the Lord and have Bible study with your, with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, with your family. Raise them up in the way they should go. There's a time for all of that. But there's another time when you yourself on purpose dwell, not visit, dwell in the secret chamber, the secret place, your prayer closet, that place where you lock everybody else out and only you and God inside there. That's got to come for every person. That's personal responsibility. I'm sure glad I go to a church where our pastor studies the Bible and prays and takes it seriously and doesn't read it out of a book and doesn't buy his sermons for 50 cents at the bookstore or three for a dollar. I'm, I'm so glad he studies out and he, he speaks on behalf of God and gives us his message. That doesn't, that doesn't resolve you of your responsibility as a believer to read the Bible for yourself and to study the scriptures to show yourself approved. There comes a place where every single solitary person, I'm glad that my grandmother was a born-again Christian. Some of our, even beyond my grandparents, have got one of their old Bibles, and it says, I receive and accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, and pray that all of the generations of my descendants will do so as well. Written right in one of my old great-great-aunt or great-great-great somebody's Bible, and I've seen it, and her prayer was answered. All of our relatives on that side of the family, everybody is a born-again Christian, loves the Lord. But you can't go to heaven because my great-great-great-grandma and my great-great-grandma and my great-grandma and my grandma and my mother and all my brothers and sisters and my dad and my dad's mother, and they were all Christians, so I'm good. No, you have to make that decision on your own. You make that determination and decision by yourself. You accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ and everything he did for you on your own. I, that's a grand message for me. I'm glad about that. Because, because if you live in a society that's godless and no one believes in, in the Lord Jesus and no one believes in what he did on the cross, you can still believe. Everybody else in your family can be cursed and you can be blessed. Everybody else can be an unbeliever, and that can't stop you from in, embracing and accepting and receiving what the Lord Jesus did for you. See, that's just taking personal responsibility for your own walk with the Lord. Both starting off and accepting Him, and then growing in Him, and, in, and even, even, even coming to church. Now, I've said about people, and this is really our heart, I've watched people struggle. Anybody beside me lift your hand and say, I've struggled once in a while? I have both hands and one foot. See, everybody, everybody struggles on occasion. Everybody. Don't think because you're struggling. Well, you, nobody else does, and everybody else is always strong. Everybody else is on top of the mountain. Everybody else has no battles and no struggle. Baloney. That's a lie. That's a lie. We fight our way through. This is all the good fight of faith. Great it is to dream the dream when you stand in youth at the starry stream, but greater still is to fight life through and at the end say the dream came true. No, no, life is a fight, and, 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 and sure, we, 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 we struggle, and I, I've seen people struggling, and I've looked at them, and I said, now listen here, you're not going to backslide, you're not going to give up, you're not going to quit, and, and if you feel weak, and if you feel like you've fallen, then here's what we'll do. Two of us are going to pick you up, and we're going to piggyback you into heaven if we have to. We're not going to let you fall behind. We're not going to let you fall away. We're not going to let you give up. We're not going to let you give out. We will not let you quit. You're going to heaven with us, praise God. We'll drag you up the plank of the ark before the rain starts falling if we have to. We're not leaving you behind. Now, I realize that's our spirit as Christians. 
We don't laugh when somebody around us falls and, and fails and, 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 and falls out of the race. And, and that's not a good moment. That, that, that we, we care for one another and we, we love one another and we believe in one another and we help one another. We don't shoot our wounded because they fell and they stumbled. Uh, we pick them back up, brush them off and say, you can make it. You can do this and get back started again and jump back in the race. That's, that's what we do. But ultimately, uh, it's not about the people around you. Ultimately, it's not about the people really close by with you. You have to make up your own mind. You have to make your own decision. Uh, and, uh, you know, the closest people with you. You know, Lot's wife turned around and went back. Lot didn't go back. And his two daughters, they didn't go back. You know, there may be some very close people, you know, near you. Uh, but that doesn't have to, that doesn't have to uh, be your destiny. That doesn't have to be the result of your life. You can trust God. You can believe God. You can love God. You can worship God. You can obey God. You can serve God. You can know God, regardless of what happens in anybody else's life. They didn't wait to be gathered together with the, the, the there's the shepherd out there with the butterfly net, gathering everybody together and bringing them in. No, no, they gathered themselves. Isn't that what your Bible says? First verse of Nehemiah chapter 8, they gathered themselves together as one man as one man. Unity, don't have time to teach on it today, but uh, Psalm 133, all three verses, how precious, how wonderful, how blessed it is when brethren dwell together in unity. And, and watch this, now watch this, watch this. And they spoke to Ezra. I mean, 42,600 people, and they spoke to Ezra. What did they say? They said, would you please make the message short? The buffet starts right at 1130. They spoke to Ezra and said, could we just have the song service? We love to sing, but we don't think much of your preaching. They spoke to Ezra and they said, the game starts at noon. Forty-two thousand six hundred people. 42,360 people, and they all came together. They gathered themselves together, and they talked to the preacher. And they said to the preacher, bring the book of God. Bring us the word. Amen. Haven't heard any word for 30-some years. Haven't had any preaching. Haven't had any revelation. Haven't had any light. Been walking in darkness, in confusion. All mixed up. Don't know anything about the Lord but what we've heard and, and, and from tradition. That's wrong. Came together in church. All right, what do you want to do? Play bingo. What do you want to do in church today? Let's gossip about the church down the street. What do you want to do today? Well, let's tell, tell stories. Let's have this kind of service, that kind of service. They didn't do that. They all came together, 42,000 plus, stood on their feet, said, we've come here to hear God's word. We've come here to hear from our God. We've come here to hear of his mercy, to hear of his goodness, to hear of his grace, to hear of heaven, to hear of the day of judgment. We've come here to learn what his expectations are for us. We want to know what he expects of us, what he requires of us. We want to know that there's hope. We want to know that there is a God and that He actually does know who we are. We want to know that He cares for us, provides for us, and that there's something better than just fumbling and bumbling and stumbling through life with no purpose, hoping for the best. I'm here to tell you this morning there's something far greater than that. There is a God who has created everything, who knows everyone, who has a personal knowledge of you, he knows your name. He knows your address. He knows your personal situation. The Bible says he knows you so well, he numbers the hairs that are on your head. That's what the Bible says. Not even one sparrow ever falls to the ground. We were sitting in the airport in Detroit, Michigan yesterday. Paul and I sitting side by side, and this little sparrow flew down. He was flying around the airport, and he landed about three feet away. And I just looked at him. I thought, God knows where you're at. Our God knows where you're at. How does he do that? I don't know. I'm not God. Neither are you. You have all manner of limitations. He's unlimited. You're temporal and he's eternal. But during these temporal years of your existence on this planet, his will and his plan and his purpose for you was that you come to the saving knowledge of his son, 
Jesus Christ, the only Savior, the only Lord. He sent him because he loved the world so much. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in him would never perish but have everlasting life. That's God's plan for you. That you come into relationship with his Son, Jesus our Lord. The only way to heaven. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And he's not holding you out. He's inviting you in. He's inviting you in. If any man open the door and invite me in, I'll come in. I'll come in. He didn't come to John 3.16. You put that up on screen. But John 3.17 said he didn't come to condemn the world. He came that the whole world through him be saved. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Isn't the love of God wonderful? There it is. For God so loved the world, gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believed in him should not perish. But God doesn't want you to perish. God doesn't want you to suffer. God doesn't want you to be separated from him for all of eternity. He wants you to have everlasting life in his presence. In the next verse, verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through him might be saved. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.